So welcome everyone to Grand Rounds. Uh, a few announcements before we get started. Um, next week's Grand Rounds will be the Spiegel Lecture given by Kevin Oxner, who's professor and chair in the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. And the title of his talk is Evolving Perspectives on the Neural Bases of Self-Control. Uh, a few announcements. So we encourage everyone to ask questions at any time during the talk. And to do that, you can click on the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, please don't put questions in the chat, but in the Q&A, it's easier for us to just monitor them in one place. Um, and we ask attendees from all of our missions at Columbia and NISPE to ask questions, including those in education, research, and clinical groups, uh, and to share their perspective and questions at any time. We will prioritize questions from trainees during the Q&A. And so if you're a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question. And something new that you may have noticed that we've started doing in recent weeks is we've figured out how to manage the Zoom webinar a little better. And we're actually able to promote people to from an attendee of the webinar to a panelist so that you can ask a question yourself. Um, I've found that really wonderful to be able to see some of our colleagues and peers during the Q&A section. And so I'd really welcome, I'd really encourage you uh, to do that. If you could, when you post a question in the Q&A, let us know if you're open to doing that. You could write something like willing to ask myself or prefer question to be read. And if you're willing to ask it yourself, you could do so with, with your camera on or off. So I really encourage people um, to, to um, offer that and to ask your question directly and to avoid my having to read it. I think it'll be much more interesting that way. Um, okay, a few other announcements before we get started. We've been compiling a list of potential speakers for the upcoming academic year, and we would really value your input. We're seeking to have a diverse list of speakers covering a broad range of topics. Um, and Simon is putting a link in the chat uh, for a survey. Uh, you could bookmark that link. We'll keep that link active. But we are really actually trying to do planning and scheduling of next academic year's grand rounds in the coming week or two. So if you have ideas, now is the time to speak up. Click that link, bookmark it, and, and fill out, uh, nominate a speaker as soon as you can. And ideally, it would be a speaker who's uh, work you know well, but you also know to be a good speaker. Um, okay. And so now I'm going to move on to today's Grand Rounds. I'm really thrilled and honored to be able to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Carl Dyseroth. Uh, Dr. Dyseroth is a professor of bioengineering and of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Stanford, uh, and he's an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, he received his undergraduate degree from Harvard uh, in 1992, his PhD from Stanford in 1998, and his MD from Stanford in 2000, where he remains on faculty. Uh, he also completed training in um, adult psychiatry through a residency there. And interestingly, in addition to his research activities, he continues as a practicing psychiatrist, focusing on affective disorders and autism spectrum disease using medications and neural stimulation. And I think as we'll hear from his talk and um, from a book that he's written recently, he thinks a lot about the, the crosstalk between his research life and his clinical life, which is really a model, I think, for, for those of us in biomedical research. So uh, in his research career, Dr. Dyseroth has made key discoveries of tools that really have revolutionized neuroscience, that's me speaking, not him, um, and are used in laboratories all around the world, including many laboratories in our institution. These technologies, including optogenetics and hydrogel tissue chemistry, allow scientists to observe and control biological systems like the brain at high resolution while maintaining these systems in the intact state. And those, these techniques have been used to ask many basic questions about how the brain functions, but also to they have spawned a real revolution in translational research, um, manipulating brain function in ways that are relevant to psychiatric and neurologic illness to try to gain insights into those conditions. Um, and as I was alluding to, Dr. Dyseroth recently published a book of literary nonfiction relating the experiences of psychiatric patients to modern neuroscience called Projections. It was published last year. And Dr. Dyseroth has received many awards. Um, I'll highlight just a few. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2012, to the US National Academy of Engineering in 2019, 
to the National Academy of Medicine in 2010. Um, and then last year, he received the Albert Lasker Basic Medical Research Award, which is one of the most prestigious awards internationally for a fundamental discovery that opens up a new area of biomedical science for his work on light sensitive microbial proteins and optogenetics. And so we're really thrilled and, uh, and grateful to have Dr. Dysroth speaking to us today. The title of his talk is Inner Workings of Channel Rhodopsins and Brains. So welcome Dr. Dysroth, thank you again. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey, for that very gracious introduction um, and really excited to share our work with you. I'm gonna talk about some uh, unpublished work, some very recently published work, and also some some work going back even to the 1800s. So hopefully it should be uh, a fun ride. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. I have so many great friends and, and colleagues there at, at Columbia and the, your department and your whole community in psychiatry is such a, a wonderful place. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get together in, in person soon. Um, but I, I, this is a great opportunity to share uh, some of the excitement uh, that's that's going on in the field, and and I'll, I'll uh, um, looking. I'm also particularly looking forward to the uh, conversations uh, afterward. Now, um, I'm a, as you heard, I'm a psychiatrist. This is actually the office where I, I see patients. I'm sorry, it's a bit of an old building, and so every now and then I'll I'll freeze briefly, but don't worry, I'll I'll come back. Um, this is a here's where I, I treat patients with depression, and uh, I help. Uh, patients with autism spectrum disorder with some of their comorbid symptoms. I use uh, medicines, uh, therapy, even uh, some brain stimulation methods um, like VNS and TMS. But um, most of the time I'm in the laboratory, uh, we do a lot of uh, fundamental neuroscience and a lot of fundamental uh, chemistry and biochemistry, which uh, that is where I started my scientific journey. And it's just amazing the connections that can be, uh, you know, forged across scales, uh, across realms of biology. And one theme is how we can gain insights into complex systems like the mammalian brain and even very high level aspects of its function, like dissociation, uh, something that this community uh, more than most uh, is aware of. And uh, we can get this insight from studying uh, microbes and microbial proteins at atomic level resolution. Now, um, as I mentioned, this is uh, surprising that we can approach these very high level uh, uh, functions and dysfunctions of the, of the mammalian brain. This is a painting by Andy Warhol that to me evokes uh, this phenomenon of dissociation. And the uh, scientific path to getting to insight into this actually in some ways dates back to uh, the mid 1800s. This uh, is Andre Fominsen, a botanist uh, who lived in St. Petersburg. And he studied uh, single celled algae of the Chlamydomonas type and uh, found that uh, if he put them in a dish and illuminated from one side, they would move quickly uh, to one side of the dish. And these are single celled plants. They have flagella so they can swim to find the right light level for photosynthesis and survival. And they have eye spots that they use to detect light. Uh, many interesting things about these organisms, uh, but it turned out much later that the, re the way they detect light is with uh, a class of uh, protein called a microbial opsin. And those in turn are found across many single celled uh, organisms, uh, and including archaebacteria. And uh, those were first identified by uh, Dieter Osterhelt, uh, a, a German uh, biochemist and, and biophysicist. Uh, this is a picture of him uh, at uh, UCSF, uh, the year he made this discovery in 1970. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Peter Hagemann, uh, my uh, friend and colleague who I'll tell you about in a moment. Now, what uh, Osterheld did was he uh, was preparing the uh, purple membrane of Archaebacteria from Halobacterium salinorum. And he found that under certain conditions of light and solvent that it would change uh, color uh, from uh, purple to yellow. And he knew enough uh, uh, of membrane proteins to know that this suggested there was a rhodopsin, which uh, were known at the time to be in uh, metazoans uh, uh, and, and in our own eyes, but uh, nobody had thought they were in microbes, uh, especially not archaebacteria. But he found that in fact, uh, there was a, a, a protein uh, that jam-packed the membrane of these archaebacteria and it was a light activated proton pump uh, 
uh, and he, he uh, uh, studied it, uh, named it bacteria rhodopsin, and found that, uh, for example, when light was delivered, as you can see by the H nu here, that there would be pH changes. And that was the proton pumping that was later used by the organism to, after setting up gradients to generate uh, energy. So uh, foundational biochemical work, uh, what did Peter do? Peter found uh, that Chlamydomonas um, makes a version of these that uh, doesn't move one ion uh, per photon, but moves many, opens a pore in the membrane and hundreds of ions can flow through. And he did this by catching uh, Chlamydomonas on a, a pipette and doing patch clamp and found very fast uh, flagellar uh, currents. And uh, these turned out to be part of a very broad uh, family of microbial proteins. Here are the ion pumps, including bacteria rhodopsin, HSBR, uh, from Osterhelten and colleagues. Uh, Peter identified these chlamydomonas channel rhodopsins. Um, we uh, identified these uh, red light activated channel rhodopsins that turned out to be crucial for uh, allowing single cell optogenetics that I'll tell you about shortly. Uh, we also found that we could create anion channels. So the original ones uh, identified uh, dating back to Feminsen uh, and going through uh, Peter's work and my work, these were all uh, cation channels. They fluxed positive ions like sodium and potassium. But we found we could actually make anion channels and then later those turned out to be naturally occurring as well. So you can have a chloride conducting channel rhodopsin. And then we later found, uh, this one's called carmine. There's yet another major branch of this uh, uh, family. And these are the so-called pump-like channel rhodopsins because they're more closely related phylogenetically to these bacteria rhodopsins, even though they're cation conducting channel rhodopsins. And so by function, more similar to this group, by evolutionary origin, more similar to the pumps. So a very interesting family. So that has been a lot of fun, uh, just our basic discovery of these amazing uh, classes of these amazing uh, uh, proteins. The other thing we've worked hard on is diving into how they work, uh, the structure and function. I won't spend too much time on it, but I, it's important to, to give a, a flavor of how these uh, beautiful proteins work. And we've been able to get the high resolution structures of the cation conducting channel rhodopsins uh, back in 2012, of the anion conducting channel rhodopsins in 2018. And then just this year, uh, we were able to identify the uh, cryo-EM structure uh, at two angstrom resolution of the uh, pump-like channel rhodopsins. And it's been amazing to see how these proteins work. They're dimers or trimers of seven transmembrane proteins, and they have a, a chromophore called all trans retinal embedded within them that detects the photon and carries out the conformational change. Now, um, this of course is really uh, fun basic science. We've also been able to use the crystal structures and the cryo-EM structures to radically change how these proteins work, sometimes in very useful ways. So we can actually put these into neurons. We can uh, flash blue light uh, pulses for uh, this particular one that we sped up. We made it a very fast channel rhodopsin with some guided structure-guided mutagenesis. And we could get to hundreds of hertz, hundreds of action potentials per second that we could elicit with light pulses uh, as those positive ions came rushing into the cell. By 2011, we'd made red light activated channel rhodopsins as I alluded to earlier, and having knowing exactly which mutations to make was really helped by structural modeling. We also made bistable forms of the opsins, so we didn't have to give a light pulse uh, for every action potential, but we could flip cells into and out of excitable states with different colors of light. And also we made inhibitory channel rhodopsins, as I mentioned, we could convert them into a chloride conducting form like the GABA receptor and make it inhibitory. And then we could make those into this step-like form as well. So we could create stable inhibited states. So I won't go into details on how all this works, but just to give you a flavor of the potential, but you can, by diving into how these proteins work, you can uh, create totally new kinds of, of uh, tool. And of course we find this uh, so useful because these are single proteins encoded by single genes. We can use genetic or anatomical tricks and int introduce these uh, 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 proteins into individual cells defined by genetic type, by wiring type or intersections and combinations of, the, of, of, of those. And then we can deliver light. We can bathe the, the region of the brain in light uh, and only the targeted cells are the initial, only the, the opsin expressing cells are the initial direct target of the intervention. We can turn them on or off. We can be synchronous or asynchronous as we like, as I'll show you. Uh, we can do it over any time scale we like, and we can monitor what's going on uh, as we do that, both behaviorally and in terms of activity of the brain. And 
as much as we like electrical and magnetic interventions, it's what we have uh, uh, in one whole branch of psychiatry, we can't resolve uh, cell types. And so it's limited uh, as, a, as a research tool, but this allows us to, to bring that element of, of cell specific uh, causality. And for the psychiatry uh, audience, uh, you know, a, fl a flavor of what you can do with this sort of thing uh, uh, relates to uh, anxiety. And we've studied this uh, over the years in the laboratory. One way we, you can do this is you can make a, uh, a very concentrated virus, uh, uh, adeno-associated virus solution uh, jam-packed with these uh, opsin-expressing viruses. And you can inject that into a brain region, in this case, the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis or BNST of a mouse. Uh, human beings, of course, also have this uh, structure. And you can deliver light by fiber optic to this region uh, and turn the cells on or off in any pattern you like during free behavior. Uh, but also you can do something pretty interesting. You can also deliver light to downstream structures as well, uh, regions of the brain to which the BNST projects. And the reason that works and is useful is that the axons of the cells that live here and project to here are the only light sensitive element in this downstream region. And so you can recruit cells defined by connectivity as your initial direct target. Even if these different cell types are not known to be genetically distinct, you don't have to find a new promoter that somehow uh, allows you to guide expression in one type or another. You can rely on anatomy and, and recruit cells defined by connectivity. And, you know, anxiety, we all know it's a, it's a wonderfully complex state. We have uh, subjective uh, feelings inside. There are behavioral changes that happen. There are physiological changes that happen, like heart rate and respiratory rate changes. And what we were able to, to find in this work was that uh, these different projections coming from the BNST to different uh, downstream locations each recruited different features of the state of anxiety or anxiolysis. So the projection to the VTA mediated the uh, uh, positive or negative valence of the state for the animal. The uh, projection to the lateral hypothalamus mediated the behavioral risk avoidance. And the projection to the parabrachial nucleus mediated the respiratory rate changes. And each of these was, was cleanly picked out one feature. So the animal didn't have any subjective preference as picked out by behavioral measures to any of these interventions, but, but did to this intervention, for example. So complex states are assembled from their parts. The parts are defined by uh, projections. And we now uh, know this with cell type resolution and, and causality. And this has been uh, uh, applied uh, across uh, you know, many realms of, of psychiatry and, and, and neuroscience. This is one of my favorite examples from Catherine Duloc's group at, at Harvard. She studied the quintessential mammalian brain state of parenting. Uh, and she did some beautiful experiments very similar conceptually to this, but in a totally different realm, uh, looking at the uh, different features of parenting. And part of parenting, as, as all parents know, is grooming uh, the, the uh, young. And so she studied that, uh, but also there are other features of parenting, like going out to collect the kids when they've strayed too far and bringing them back to the nest or the home. Uh, of course, we all, we're all we're well aware of that as well. Uh, but it turns out these different features, although they're governed by cells arising from the same region, uh, the projections from one to, to one part of the brain or another pick out different features of this uh, state of parenting. So uh, this particular projection mediates the grooming behavior, but doesn't affect the uh, crossing of a barrier to retrieve the young. In contrast, a different projection, in this case, the VTA, mediates the uh, retrieving uh, the, the challenge crossing of a barrier to retrieve the young and bring them back, but didn't affect grooming. And so this is, and there are many other examples of this, but just a couple examples that I, I like. Now uh, for the, some of this can get pretty technical, but uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, for the, for, the, for the general public, for everybody, uh, I tried to convey some of this work uh, in a, uh, a, a series of stories about patients uh, and relating that back to the science to give the broader uh, public a, a sense of the excitement of, of where neuroscience is going. And uh, I won't spend too long on this, uh, but just to give you a flavor of, of this, the different classes of psychiatric illness, there's uh, bereavement and depression, uh, there's mania, uh, 
social behavior alterations, including autism, borderline personality, psychosis, eating disorders, uh, dementia. Uh, and these are, you know, there's an opportunity that uh, to, to share what's going on in neuroscience and in psychiatry with the broader uh, community that I'd be happy to talk more about. The hope is that people who have an experience of psychiatric illness or friends or family who do, as we all know, it can feel incredibly uh, isolating, uh, terrifying, hard to explain. Uh, and uh, the fact is, uh, as this community very well knows, uh, now we are achieving a more material and physical understanding of some of these states. And it's important to, to share that uh, uh, with the, the broader public. Now, we've been able to come to uh, single cell level work as well, and this is very exciting. This gets us to this, this fundamental elemental level of, of brain function, and this took a long time. The initial uh, uh, instantiation of, of optogenetics, which is still the, the workhorse used in, in thousands of labs around the world, is a cell type control where you turn up or down the uh, excitability or, or the activity of a cell types defined by uh, genetics or, or projections. But uh, we've been working hard on getting to the single cell level. And starting in 2012, uh, we were able to actually get uh, a single cell level uh, a control. We had a couple papers in Nature Methods, including in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Rafa Yusta at Columbia. And we went on from there to uh, develop methods to uh, scale up the number of single cells that we could control in the brains of living animals, uh, drive cells in or out of synchrony, all during uh, complex behaviors. And here's an example of the cell type specific stimulation. All these rainbow T cells are targeted cells and we're stimulating them in this case all together. And uh, we're using a genetically encoded calcium indicator to reveal how well we've successfully stimulated them. And you can see as the little traces all go up together, we're stimulating all the T cells together. Here are all the targeted cells like T5, T10. And you can see right next to them, there are these NT cells, non-targeted cells that we're not stimulating. We're not guiding little beams of light to with our microscopy approach. And those are active, but are doing their own thing and not responding, uh, even though the cell right next to them is being stimulated. And so you can get a flavor of the uh, opportunity here we can now individually specify cells, including by virtue of naturally occurring activity, uh, location in space and other, other properties. And we can do this in awake behaving animals. And one thing that made this single cell work so critical actually derived in part from our structural understanding. Um, this is a really zoomed in view of the channel rhodopsin pore uh, uh, based on our, our structural uh, uh, work. And, this is that all trans retinal molecule. It's a vitamin A-like molecule. It's got this polyene uh, conjugated double bond structure that allows it to absorb the photons. It's embedded within the retinal binding pocket. This is the channel. These blue uh, arrows show the pore through which the ions flow. These gray spheres are water molecules. And mutating this residue really allowed us, this glutamate 83 really allowed us to achieve a highly functional red light activated channel rhodopsin. And that was critical uh, for getting to this uh, single cell control uh, during behavior. And uh, we went, in this case, this was the first con uh, control of mammalian behavior with multiple individually specified uh, cells. And we were able to achieve that with single cell optogenetic control. And we were in orbital frontal cortex doing this work. This is work from Josh Jennings, Tina Kim, and, and Jim Marshall in the lab. And we, um, you know, in, in human beings, uh, there's a syndrome called orbitofrontal syndrome. Uh, after a stroke, you can have severe alterations in social and, and feeding behavior both. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that the cells that naturally respond to either social interaction or feeding are intermixed in orbital frontal cortex. They're in the same layer. They appear to be the same genetic cell type. At the time, we certainly didn't know anything about different projections. And so the question is, uh, are these cells important in feeding? Um, we can see they're active during feeding. And here's another one of these traces, the F cells or feeding cells. Uh, they all go up when at the little vertical gray bars, we deliver a high calorie reward to this mouse. The non-feeding cells, which are right in the same field of view, are active, but not active during feeding. Uh, 
So the question is, okay, there are cells that are, you could call them feeding cells. They're active during feeding, but not social interaction or other, other uh, behaviors. And then there are these non-feeding cells. But are the feeding cells important? Are they uh, just reporting on the fact that feeding has happened? Or maybe they even inhibit feeding. Maybe they shut down a feeding bout, uh, or maybe they promote feeding. And it was only with single cell resolution optogenetics that we could get to this question. And, and here are different trials of the mouse looking for the reward. And uh, here, each little uh, uh, spot, little orange spot is a lick for food. And you can see there's a typical response, a pattern of licking. And if, but if you stimulate the feeding cells, uh, you can uh, enhance and prolong the feeding response. So these are promoting uh, the feeding response. And it matters that you pick out the feeding cells if you recruit instead the social cells, you actually get an inhibition of the feeding response. And if you pick out the non-social, non-feeding cells with optogenetics, you don't get any effect on feeding at all. So this uh, allows us to, to understand uh, what, which activity patterns uh, matter and it stemmed uh, in large part from this OPSIN discovery and, and structural engineering work. And at, here I like to always tipped uh, the hat to Francis Crick of, of Double Helix uh, fame. He was, uh, as many of you know, he was very interested in neuroscience uh, later in his career. And he published an amazing piece in 1999, uh, basically uh, asking for this, this level of, uh, of control. He said, what we really need in neuroscience is a way to turn types of neurons on or off in the animal in a rapid manner. He didn't even ask for single cell control, but he did say types of neurons. He did say the ideal signal would be light. Uh, and he did think uh, a red or infrared would be important. The slide I just showed you previously indeed was using uh, to achieve lower scattering, uh, a two photon method and infrared uh, illumination. He had no idea how to do it, said it was far-fetched, but uh, I think he would have been happy with this result. And, you know, in thinking about what made him so perceptive, I think it was because he was coming from this, uh, you know, biophysical and genetic uh, background where there's this gain and loss of function approach, even for incredibly complex systems like developmental biology, like signaling within a cell. It doesn't matter how much feedback or connection or redundancy there is, that's uh, actually a, a, a region where causal precisely targeted uh, interventions gain or loss of function are, are turned out to be so important and so illuminating in biology. And just like we study the role of a protein or a gene with gain or loss of function interventions, uh, uh, we now can study the role of activity in precisely defined circuit elements with gain and loss of function. And these can operate over any time scale, synchrony or asynchrony, single cells or, or groups of cells defined in ways that keep up with the advancing cell type uh, um, uh, information that is coming. So uh, it's, and of course, many mysteries remain after you identify the, the, the causal principles. And I'd like to show this as well to, to reflect on this. This is the famous antennapedia mutation of Drosophila, where antenna are converted into uh, legs. And this is at a precisely defined uh, locus, uh, uh, the antennapedia locus on the, on the chromosome. Uh, homeobox uh, uh, genes, uh, of which this is a representative one that caused these very fundamental pattern formation uh, changes. And uh, the logic of pattern formation and body plan formation, and, uh, you know, is illuminated by these precisely targeted gain and loss of function interventions. Of course, many mysteries remain then exactly how is a leg uh, generated, for example, with all the downstream genes and cells that are recruited. But the, uh, the, the causal targeted intervention, gain and loss of function of antennapedia uh, uh, reveals the, the pattern formation logic. Now, that, so that's uh, you know, the, the, the state of the field uh, up to uh, very recently. And I wanna share some uh, very recent excitement on the uh, structure of carmine. And I'm, I showed you these zoomed in views of the channel rhodopsin uh, and the cation conducting and anion conducting ones are uh, dimers. So what's the story with, with carmine? Uh, where did it come from and why is it different? Well, we got to carmine uh, because after we had initial structure uh, guided uh, uh, engineering uh, and structure guided transcriptome mining, we found a number of interesting new uh, possible microbial Ops and genes that, that we thought could be could be useful. 
Uh, together with uh, uh, colleagues, including Susumu Yoshizawa and Hideaki Kato, we carried out very broad transcriptome mining. Uh, uh, Yoon Kim in my lab, uh, critical in this. And we used our knowledge of the structure to look for in these uh, um, oceanic uh, um, uh, microbiome derived uh, 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 transcriptomes. Uh, we looked for uh, rhodopsins that had what we predicted would be an excitatory pattern, which is a pore lined with negatively charged residues that would prevent anions from going through, uh, like chloride, and allow cations to go through. And those, uh, due to the gradients that are normally present in the nervous system, would pr we predict to be excitatory. So we were looking for excitatory channel rhodopsins in a very unbiased way from these uh, oceanic transcriptomes. And the structure helped us narrow things down. We then carried out a, a patch clamp to be very certain what each uh, uh, protein was doing. And uh, we found a very interesting protein, which turned out to be this pump-like channel rhodopsin uh, and uh, came from this family more closely related to the pumps than the cation channels. But it was a cation channel and it was an excitatory channel rhodopsin. Our team used this. I won't go over this, this paper in detail, but we used carmine because it, it was so unusual. It had enormous photocurrents and it was very light sensitive. And that let us control many more individually specified cells at once in the brain of a living mouse. We could use much less light power than we normally would and therefore per cell and therefore control many more cells. And we can now control hundreds of individually specified cells in synchrony or asynchronously as we like. And we found that we could effectively play in percepts to a mouse brain, even in the absence of visual stimulus, we could activate enough neurons uh, that naturally responded, for example, to vertical or horizontal bars, that even in the absence of a stimulus, we could make a mouse behave, uh, both behaviorally and in terms of the internal representation, cellular resolution internal representations, we could make the mouse and the brain uh, behave uh, as it was during a specific uh, uh, sensory discrimination. And getting to this level of many hundreds of cells spanning wide swaths of the brain was exciting and it was enabled by this very high potency uh, carmine. It has such high potency that we can uh, even access very deep structures in the mouse brain non-invasively, but still at high temporal resolution. And this is work from Richie Chen and Felicity Gore in the lab. Uh, Felicity came from Columbia and Richard Axel's lab. She had a uh, a preparation where she was recording from deep in the ventral tegmental area. And what uh, she and Richie found was that you could illuminate uh, even outside the skull uh, and recruit your deep channel rhodopsin targeted cells with uh, a good temporal resolution and even affect behavior. Animals would work hard by lever pressing to get light delivered uh, non-invasively to these uh, deeply situated cells. And other controls revealed it was not the axons, but it really was the deep cells that were uh, important. Now, carmine was so interesting that we wanted to figure out what its structural uh, principles were that, that made it so different. And so our, our structural team uh, is shown here. A um, uh, number of wonderful folks. This is Yoon Kim. This is Hideaki uh, Kato. Uh, Elena Tadani is now in, in Manhattan working at uh, uh, D. Shaw. And we have, uh, we're very excited that we have the structure now of, of carmine by cryoEM, very high resolution structure. And it's a trimer of three seven transmembrane proteins in contrast to the dimer of the other cation conducting channel rhodopsins. And this was really cool because if you remember Dieter Osterhelt, uh, the discoverer of this, this class, uh, he uh, also got a structure of the pumps uh, actually several, and they are trimers. So the pumps are trimers. And as it turns out, this is also a, a trimer. And so that was very gratifying and interesting. And then we were able to such a high resolution structure that we could dive into the pore and we have some insight into why it has such a high conductance. For example, the carmine pore compared to the more classical cation conducting channel rhodopsins has a very neutral inner lining of the pore. Uh, even though it still has electrostatic negativity at the entrance and, and exit, as shown by this red uh, negativity, uh, that helps to deter anion flux. But inside, it's pretty neutral, and that may allow uh, faster transit of ions. It's also amazing that it's got uh, very significant ion selectivity, not just for cations, 
but it actually excludes divalent cations like calcium and magnesium very well, uh, as shown here. In fact, it even has substantial potassium selectivity. It fluxes potassium much more than uh, sodium, although it does uh, flux both. Other members of the family, the KCRs that John Spudich and his uh, colleagues discovered, are even more selective for potassium. So these are seven transmembrane proteins, not classically thought you know, to be professional uh, uh, selective channels, certainly not potassium selective. Uh, as you know, there's a whole uh, you know, very beautiful uh, field of understanding how potassium selectivity arises from professional metazoan potassium channels. Here's a seven transmembrane protein with a retinal in it. And, it's a, a, and these pump-like channel adopsins achieve uh, actually quite high potassium specificity uh, with the seven transmembrane architecture. So that's really exciting. And we've made, uh, not all of these are published, but we're happy to share them with, with anybody. Um, we've made new carmine-based uh, tools. Um, one thing, I've shown you a lot of this calcium imaging where we see elevations in calcium flux through um, using genetically encoded calcium indicators. Those are the best ones of those are blue light activated. So we put a lot of effort into enhancing red light activated channel redopsins so we can use blue light for calcium imaging and red light to control the opsins uh, together. But one problem has been uh, what we call the blue shoulder. Um, and what this is, you know, the, the spectrum of channel redopsins is pretty broad. Um, this is the two photon spectrum, but same basic principle. Uh, as you go to the right, it's more red. As you go to the left, it's more blue. All the microbial opsins are, are pretty potently recruited in the blue, even if they're also recruited in the red. And so that's been a bit of a problem. You can definitely drive them with red light, but you also are driving them with blue light. And so if you've got a blue light activated uh, calcium indicator, you run the risk of while you're imaging, you run the risk of having a side effect of stimulating your, your target cells. Well, uh, having the carmine structure allowed us to engineer around the retinal binding pocket, which sets the spectrum as we had found in, uh, through prior work. And by mutating residues around the retinal, we were able to create a new variant of carmine that we call RS for redshifted carmine with the first really potently reduced uh, blue shoulder. And this works really well together with calcium imaging. And uh, Masatoshi Inoue and colleagues in the lab showed how this worked. We used a, a method we developed. Uh, uh, here we have three color fiber photometry where we have a fiber optic, both delivering and collecting uh, light uh, uh, from the brain of a behaving mouse. And you're able to do these really, you know, here in medial prefrontal cortex of a behaving mouse, you can do these uh, cell type interaction experiments now with three different colors of light. There's stimulating RS carmine, the excitatory uh, channel rhodopsin to control. And then we've got two different calcium indicators. Uh, in this case, one called G-CAMP uh, and one called X-CAMP activated in the blue and in the green. And you can, distribute these tools however you like. Uh, here's one configuration where you have carmine in the excitatory pyramidal cells in prefrontal cortex and the X-CAMP indicator also in these cells. And then you've got the green light activated indicator in the parvalbumin inhibitory GABAergic cells. And you can stimulate with one color of light an image with the others. And you can see if you stimulate carmine in the pyramidal cells, you can see both the pyramidal and the parvalbumin cells uh, responding because these cells are exciting those. So you're getting the real uh, time cell type interaction in the brain of this awake uh, animal. But if you switch up the configuration, if you put the carmine in the uh, parvalbumin inhibitory cells, this is what you see. Of course, you're exciting the parvalbumin cells, you see their response, but then you're inhibiting the pyramidal cells due to this inhibitory interaction. So three different colors of light all operating together uh, and you can see the instantaneous influence of one cell type on another. It's very important to track how well you're doing in the stimulated populations. You effectively get, can get a normalized or calibrated uh, measure of one cell type's influence on another, uh, normalized to how well you've, you've stimulated the initial direct uh, target. And so that's a very exciting development in the, in the field. Now, um, that's sort of where optogenetics uh, ha has come to the, to the moment. Uh, and an, an example application also very recent and timely and, and um, 
you know, with many uh, so avenues coming from this into the future has to do with starting to approach these very uh, high level questions about the integrated working of the brain as an intact dynamical system. All the work I've shown you has been in awake behaving animals with intact functioning brains, but in many cases focused in on uh, local circuitry, like uh, what's happening in orbital frontal cortex or what's happening in, in visual cortex. And we image very locally with these relatively small fields of view. We deliver light uh, focally. But I think, I think, and I think many people would agree, there are some fascinating questions in neuroscience and psychiatry that have to do with the brain as an intact dynamical system that maybe can only be understood at a much broader scale, integrating information from across the brain all at once. And dissociation, I think, is, is no exception. Um, of course, this community knows better than most about dissociation, but just to uh, uh, make sure everybody's uh, uh, up to speed. This is not something widely understood in the, in the general public. Um, when a human being dissociates, there's uh, a, a separation of cognitive processes that are normally integrated. You can have still awareness of sensation, but reduced or absent emotional response to the sensation, including if it's an aversive or painful uh, stimulus. Other phenomena with altered uh, uh, perceptions of time or interactions, derealization, depersonalization. Uh, it's, although it's complex, the descriptions are often remarkably consistent uh, across etiologies. Uh, and there are many etiologies for dissociation. It shows up in PTSD, the dissociative disorders, borderline personality. Many drugs can cause it, PCP, ketamine. Um, but it's a class of drugs that, that specifically cause dissociation. Other potent psychoactive agents like hallucinogens don't specifically cause dissociation. Uh, trauma, you know, very high prevalence. More than two thirds of people who've experienced uh, trauma will dissociate, can show up in, in epilepsy, but very interesting state, very poorly understood. And as I mentioned, the descriptors are really interesting and often consistent across etiologies. Uh, dissociative disorder, here's a quote from a patient saying, if my mind is a car, I'm in the passenger seat looking at myself driving. So separation of the sense of self from the, the body. A patient on ketamine this describes it as you're in the audience. You could watch the movie of your life and judge every aspect of it without any sort of emotional reaction. Watching the movie of life. So the self is, is separate from uh, the, the body. So I don't think anybody, including us, had a very clear idea of how this very, very interesting state could, could happen. But one thing uh, we thought is that this seems to involve the integration or linking of different parts of the body, uh, of the brain uh, together, uh, including parts that represent the body and, and the self. And so maybe we need a truly integrated brain-wide uh, global uh, uh, and, and truly simultaneous uh, way of assessing uh, brain activity. Uh, many people have worked on increasingly wide field optics to get uh, a broader scope. Some of these involve uh, sort of tiling. So you, you do get uh, information from across the brain, but not truly synchronous. You sort of uh, scan or tile. Our presumption, uh, right or wrong, was that uh, that might not lead us to insight uh, of the kind that, that we wanted. And so we self-imposed a constraint of true simultaneity and we built uh, truly um, wide field uh, optics to allow us to see across the entire uh, dorsal uh, cortex of the, of the mouse brain during awake behavior um, and during administration of dissociative uh, drugs. So uh, we use genetically encoded uh, calcium indicators to get a, a sense of activity. We have different wide field optics that even give us cellular resolution at this wide scope, but also we could pull back from cellular resolution and get this sort of regional uh, map. And uh, if a mouse is uh, doing nothing that we know of, you see waves and patterns and swirls of activity with red here being more active and blue less active. Uh, an amazing pattern leapt out at us when we gave dissociative uh, drugs, in this case, ketamine, similar thing with PCP, and just the dissociative drugs. We saw this rhythm pop out in this one posteromedial part of the brain, and that uh, 
turned out to be uh, a patch of the mammalian cortex called retrosplenial cortex. Uh, the um, anatomy, the anatomical restriction was really striking. Many uh, interventions, drugs can cause uh, oscillations of various kinds. This was a, about a three hertz oscillation, a one to three hertz oscillation. And uh, many, you know, anesthetics, for example, can cause those oscillations, but they're global. The striking thing about this was that it was localized to retrosplenial cortex, and, and we didn't really have any concept of how something like that could happen or why it would happen. But it was very consistent, really just in retrosplenial cortex. It's an extremely reliable result. I had a, a donor come to visit, potential donor come to visit the lab the other day, and that students hooked it up, put the mouse in, and you know it, it was amazing. Within seconds, this, this oscillation appeared right in front of the donor. So it's that, it's that reliable. You can show it in front of a lay person just visiting the lab for the first time. And it's consistently at this, this rhythm uh, uh, and it's other dissociative agents do show this pattern in retrosplenial, but even LSD, for example, doesn't do that at all. Uh, two photon imaging, we were able to delve in, you know, cortex has these six layers like thin crepes stacked upon each other. Uh, it really seemed to, to be manifested in layer five. Uh, uh, we didn't see that rhythmicity with more superficial imaging in layer two, three. So very specific. And so then the question is, okay, here's this interesting activity pattern. Does it relate to what we think about as dissociation in any way? And so we needed a behavioral measure. We can't interview the mice, but we can separate stimulus detection from affective responses. And there's several ways that we do this. One is this uh, hot plate test. It's a very reliable, uh, non-damaging uh, test. There's a, a plate that's too warm. There's a, a, a rapid uh, reflexive paw flick away, uh, and then everything's fine. But then there's also a prolonged affective response, licking the paw to cool it, uh, and, and so on. And we thought maybe uh, we, on dissociative drugs, one of these would be present and not the other. And we found under all doses of conscious uh, ketamine uh, administration, the uh, so-called flicks, the reflexive paw flicks, re revealing uh, detection of the stimulus were unchanged, but the uh, paw licking, the more prolonged affective or self-protective response uh, collapsed at a particular dose of ketamine. And that really interested us because that was exactly the dose where the oscillation in retrosplenal cortex appears right around 25 milligrams per kilogram. Not showing causality, but but suggestive. Um, just like the oscillation, the behavior was also restricted to the dissociative drugs. So here's the ketamine effect, preserved reflexive flicks, abolished uh, uh, self-protective uh, licks, and also another measure here, uh, really not jumping to escape at all on, the, on ketamine. This is time to jump to escape, very prolonged, so it's showing less of a self-protective response. Very similar pattern with PCP, another dissociative agent, preserved or even enhanced uh, stimulus detection, abolished protective responses, and other potent psychoactive drugs not showing that, that pattern at all behaviorally. So how could you one approach this causality? Well, we used optogenetics and we used uh, uh, mouse genetics uh, and uh, we're able to do these gain and loss of function uh, experiments that are, are, are so exciting. We, uh, it's detailed in the paper, but we did a lot of exploration of where this rhythm could be coming from. Many rhythms are generated in different parts of the brain, thalamus, uh, uh, subiculum. We uh, were able to, to rule out uh, incoming sources of, of, of the rhythm, uh, but we did find internally generated uh, pacemaker channels, including this hyperpolarization activated cation channel, HCN1, uh, which is a, a known pacemaker present in the, in the heart, in the brain. It was very highly expressed, we found in retrosplenial cortex, naturally, compared to nearby neighboring regions of cortex. And that piqued our interest, uh, suggesting for where some of the specificity could arise. It's much more expressed in deep layers compared to the superficial layer two, three. And when we did a uh, we have HCN1 knockout uh, mice in, uh, in their flocks, so we can do a local uh, knockout uh, of uh, HCN1 uh, just in retrosplenial cortex. And 
uh, what we found was that when we uh, did this local knockout of the HCN1 uh, channel that's so highly expressed in, in deep retrosplenial cortex, this ketamine rhythm was largely uh, gone, was largely disrupted. So this channel does seem to be important. This pacemaker does seem to be important for local uh, generation of the ketamine-induced rhythm. Uh, what about the behavior? Well, what we found, this was really astonishing, was that in the HCN1 knockout, the reflexive stimulus detection uh, was still present. That was not surprising, but this is all on ketamine. It restored knocking out this HCN1 channel restored the affective response, the, the self-protective uh, licking response. Uh, and that was, this was on ketamine and this was adding another knockout uh, type intervention, removing the HCN1 channel and that restored the natural uh, behavioral pattern. So that was really uh, interesting and, and suggested that this channel and the rhythm it generates are, are critical to, to give rise to the dissociative like state. What about providing the rhythm? Here's where Optogenetics was uh, so useful. So we uh, uh, had for many years worked on both excitatory and inhibitory tools that could be recruited with different colors of light. And what we did was provide, again, with targeted intervention into layer five of retrosplenial uh, cortex, we provided this rhythm uh, in uh, awake behaving uh, animals. And what we found when we targeted retrosplenial cortex, preservation of the reflexive stimulus detection, the paw flicks, but potently reduced affective uh, uh, lick responses. And it mattered that this was in retrosplenial cortex and not in somatosensory, for example. Uh, uh, again, pointing to the importance of this, of this uh, region and its uh, uniqueness in generating this, this uh, pattern. Now, um, this was all in mice. One thing I, I try to do, I, I, uh, for many years I've been hosting uh, what we call our clinical subgroup, and and I have I invite neurosurgeons, neurologists, uh, psychiatrists, anesthesiologists. Uh, people come and just have sandwiches and 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 talk about uh, their science. And we were talking about our mouse work, and one of the uh, neurosurgeons present, Jamie Henderson, say, said, "Hey, we've got a a patient in the epilepsy monitoring unit whose aura is dissociative." And we were very interested in that. We said, what, what on earth are you talking about? And he said, well, this is a patient who's on our uh, comprehensive epilepsy center. And this is where we put deep recording electrodes all across the brain, penetrating uh, across the brain to map the origin of this patient's seizures who has intractable medication non-responsive seizures with the goal of finding the uh, focus so we can go in and ablate or remove it. And this patient, his aura, just like the migraine aura, this is a period of time right before the seizure when the patient starts to feel a little different, he dissociates. And we went and looked at the transcripts uh, and he had very classical descriptions. As I mentioned, spanning etiologies, it's amazing how similar this is. He said, I was listening to two parts of my brain speak to each other in a way that the third part of my brain which I considered to be me, was able to listen. So separation of self from other phenomena going on. And we said, okay, this is a huge opportunity because just like we had effectively carried out a unbiased global optical screen for uh, a pattern that might be linked to dissociation, nature and medicine together had, had provided us an unbiased electrical screen across the brain of a human being. We could now go and look at the already collected clinical data and look for an interesting uh, pattern. So again, everything, of course, you know, uh, um, uh, protected health information, confidential, IRB approved. We dove in and looked at the data and what leapt out at us was uh, a three Hertz rhythm. And it was in only one spot. It was these deep posteromedial cortices, which are homologous uh, and include the retrosplenial cortex in human beings. Well, that was uh, very, very interesting and the rhythm Similar frequency, uh, similar post-remedial uh, location, not happening elsewhere, and only happened during this patient's self-reported dissociation. Now, another interesting thing is part of epilepsy mapping is, is stimulation. And this is also important to see which are the most uh, irritable parts of, of, of the brain that might be giving rise to the seizure. And, and together with uh, Joseph Parvizi, uh, the epileptologist, uh, this 
uh, finding resulted, which is that only stimulating the sites that were able to generate this natural rhythm, these oscillating areas, gave rise to dissociation in this patient. So, so now separate from the naturally occurring aura, we're stimulating, and only when we stimulate these regions that naturally do oscillate in this patient, we got these amazing descriptions of dissociation. Uh, he said, uh, it's like a, being forced out of the cockpit of a plane. You can still see what's happening. You can see the information, see the gauges. You can't control it, but you can see it. So this seems to be important and, and causal in human beings as well. So, uh, you know, this uh, so interesting. And, and then in the last couple of slides here, I'll tell you about how we brought this back to uh, mice. And here we were able to think about this and say, okay, clearly we're on some kind of right track here, but still, how is it really uh, happening? What, okay, so the retrospinal cortex is, seems to be involved. This rhythm is important, but still seeking this deep understanding. And so we said, well, maybe the answer lies in, in wiring. So retrospinal cortex is very tightly linked to some thalamic regions, but not others. Uh, this is a diagram coming from a beautiful uh, mesoconectomic paper from the Allen Institute in 2014. And they did a lot of it in virus injections, just mapping connectivity between different cortical regions and different thalamic regions. And retrospinal cortex is tightly connected to some thalamic nuclei, but not others like AM. Those in turn uh, connect back to other regions of cortex. And there's a lot of lateral inhibition within the thalamus. Thalamic nuclei inhibit each other. This is part of how probably selective attention and selective action can happen. And we thought, well, maybe these thalamic regions are brought along in the rhythm. And then they, in the course of that rhythm, they force other thalamic regions out of sync by this lateral inhibition mechanism. And those cortical regions are then forced out of, out of sync uh, because they're following uh, these other nuclei of thalamus. All right, how could you, this is clearly a global brain-wide uh, question. And so we did the mouse equivalent of the uh, clinical mapping uh, in human beings. Uh, we used a stereo, uh, instead of stereo EEG, we used neuropixels recording electrodes. These are long shank, high contact density recording electrodes that let us get deep Unlike imaging, we can get to deep structures like the thalamus. And we asked what happens uh, on ketamine. And this is a, a brain-wide correlation plot. So different brain regions uh, on both the X and Y axis and positive correlations are red here, blue are negative. And before ketamine, there's weak brain-wide positive correlations uh, on ketamine. A very interesting thing happens. First, uh, retrospinal cortex becomes much more correlated with itself, as the red shows. That makes sense because the neurons are all oscillating together. Uh, but also, the regions of thalamus known to be tightly wired to retrospinal, indeed, uh, like AV and LD, became more correlated with retrospinal cortex. So indeed, its, it's thalamic partners were coming along with it in this oscillation. But amazingly, uh, the AM nucleus, which we were able to, to target uh, with our trajectory planning, uh, and which is not tightly wired, was actually forced into an inverse correlation out of sync with retrospinal cortex. And you can see this in the raw data. Here are the tightly wired regions of thalamus, magenta uh, and green uh, uh, going together. And here's the AM and retrospinal cortex uh, forced into this inverse correlation. So this, clarified uh, the, 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 the physical nature of what's going on brain-wide. No part of the brain is being shut down. There's not unconsciousness or numbness in the, in the anesthetized sense. Uh, no, nothing's shut down, but wide swaths of the brain can't form joint representations because they're not active uh, at the same time uh, together. And it arises from these corticothalamic uh, wiring patterns and the uh, pacemaker ion channel that is, is highly expressed in, in retrosplenial. So this was a, you know, really interesting and, and highlights the value. I've only shown you a very narrow snapshot of corticothalamic interactions. There's of course much more to thalamus, much more to cortex, bidirectional interactions. And, and this one little window is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Some of the complexities of dissociation and some of the complexities of human behavior may relate to the ability to form or not 
uh, joint representations of uh, the world and the self. And it's, uh, you know, to, to come to this sort of, uh, you know, potential insight that into these very tantalizing and mysterious questions and to have it really rooted in, in these microbial proteins and, and their beautiful structures and, and how they work at the atomic level is, is, uh, is, is just amazing. And I, I give all the uh, credit to these amazing uh, colleagues and students and postdocs and, and collaborators around the world. I've mentioned key names along the way, but I'm very grateful to them and, and uh, look forward to, to talking more with this group, uh, talk questions about psychiatry, neuroscience, writing, or anything. Thank you for your time uh, and, and look forward to, to engaging more. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. What a wonderful talk. Um, we have questions coming in. Um, let's see, and as a reminder, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A. Let us know if you're a trainee, we will prioritize those. And also new this week, let me know if you're interested and open to asking the question yourself. Uh, and I can bring you into uh, the panelist um, role to ask the question yourself if you're open to that. Um, so a first question comes from Robert Hawkins who asks, how do you target single neurons? Yes, this is one, how do we target single neurons? This was not something I, I spent much time on. Uh, it's uh, covered in, in, in detail in the papers, but I'll, I'll say very briefly, it's through light guidance strategies. And there's a couple different ways you can do it. So we can uh, use uh, effectively holograms, holographic methods. We can create a three-dimensional pattern of spots of light at cellular resolution uh, that cover a swath of the brain. So it can be in the mouse brain, a millimeter by a millimeter and about half a millimeter or so deep. And we can project dozens or hundreds of individual spots of light to cellular resolution. And that gives us the single cell control. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Phil Muskin has joined and will ask a question himself. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, Carl. Hi. Uh, the paper you presented is something I've been struggling with since my nephew actually gave me this paper uh, a couple of years ago on dissociative states. Because the dissociative states that you talked about, ketamine or trauma, are abnormal dissociative states. But we know that there are normal dissociative states. And that's uh, a daydream, uh, a pleasant daydream or a, uh, a hypnotic trance. And a plug for next week, Grand Rounds, the Spiegel Grand Rounds will be given by uh, Kevin Oxner, and we've been doing a hypnosis study now for a couple of years. So, so how do these states compare? The guy with epilepsy, he's got epilepsy, and the mice, you're in inducing this, these states with drugs, but we all dissociate, and sometimes it's a lot of fun. It is, it is an anxiety-provoking. Uh, so it seizes on a normal state, you think they, they use, and this is what I've been struggling with, is it is all the dissociative state dependent upon this mechanism or are there different mechanisms? Yeah, great question. And, and actually after the paper came out, I got a lot of emails from around, around the world. A lot of people very excited to get some material understanding of, of their dissociative states, but also several people who, who, who volunteered their extremely positive valence uh, dissociative experiences as well. So a uh, great question, very important. Uh, I would I would just uh, uh, say, uh, I do think the negative uh, dissociations or the dissociation in response to negative uh, situations may be a natural, and I think it is a natural adaptive response, you know, in, in states of extreme threat, body damage, trauma, high levels of pain, dissociation from the pain uh, may well be a very adaptive response in allowing effective uh, escape. and. You know, if the same region of the brain uh, in mouse and human uh, causes this, it's a clearly a conserved ancestral uh, property of, of the mammalian brain. And I, I, I do think it's a natural, that the, 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 this dissociation in this negative or aversive state is a, is a natural uh, response. And, and it's, it's got some clear adaptive significance. But to your question about the, the positive valence states, um, this I think comes to the, the, the question of you know, the, this broader complexity of how synchrony or asynchrony across the brain can alter our, our perception of reality. And we've got a toehold into this now. So now to answer your question, we need to look at the positive valence uh, regions of the, of, the, of the brain, those more typically associated or the cells more typically associated with them and see how those can become um, more or less in sync or out of sync with self 
uh, associated regions of the brain. So this, this is a very interesting question. Which parts of the brain are truly the self? Is it those related to the default mode network, for example, retrospinal cortex being one of those? Where are the neurons that are involved in positive responses? Are those downstream of the reward pathway, median forebrain bundle, VTA dopamine neurons? By recording in a mouse and eventually in human, we might be able to, to find uh, the corresponding increases or decreases in synchrony that correspond to the positive valence states as well. I think association, broadly stated, and dissociation is, a, is, is going to be a general principle that reveals a, a fair bit of how the, our internal states are generated. That could be incredibly important therapeutically, obviously. Yes. We can't hypnotize mice, but uh, if there's a way we can look at what's going on in the hip hypnotized brain might in some ways give us the, that kind of information. What's disconnecting and what's connecting that doesn't usually connect? Yeah. Well, you know, an opportunity for, for that is, is, is to, you know, we have patients on our epilepsy monitoring unit where we're now uh, administering ketamine to operationalize this to see what, what patterns we see. But a, a very interesting thing would be to bring in, you know, hy hypnosis experts like, like David Spiegel here. David right on. and Jose. Yep. Who, really, that would be so exciting. Yep. Yeah. Great question. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Phil. Our next question comes from a trainee, Toby Atkin, who says, dissociative experiences are accessible to study in mice using medications like ketamine. Another well-defined endpoint of numerous psychiatric disorders is the experience of catatonia. Do you have ideas for how one might study the neurobiological correlates of catatonia in a mouse model? Yeah. Very interesting. Um, Catatonia, of course, uh, very important in psychiatry, shows up in disease states, shows up in drug states. Um, and in the, in the disease states, in some cases, it's associated with uh, severe stress, often with an underlying disorder, but can be exacerbated by, by uh, stress. Um, mice uh, have uh, this... Uh, uh, spectrum of threat responses, uh, and it's, it's a cascade, a defense cascade has been called, where depending on the proximity of the threat, you'll either have active or passive behavioral responses. And so when the, and it's, there's really three phases to it. The, a very distant threat triggers a freezing response, and that's to avoid detection. As the threat is closer, then you have active avoidance, that's to get away from the, 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 the threat that, that uh, is, is approaching. And then there's yet a third phase where the threat is actually in contact and, and inescapable in that sense. And then you have a reversion back to a, a passive or, or, or immobile state, which is pretty interesting. And, and I, I do think that final state uh, of, of immobility in the, in the inescapable uh, threat might, might have some relevance to, to catatonia in, in human beings. And there, uh, again, I think the the brain-wide recording approach is very relevant because you're going to have activity patterns that are reporting on the threat, reporting on the, the pain. And, and my prediction would be those are going to become uh, uh, dissociated in this, in this uh, rhythmic way from the parts of the brain that are involved in generating uh, a voluntary movement. Great. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Bill Pfeiffer, who says, so impressive as expected. Are you and your team extending investigations of neural dynamics observed in awake mammals to networks involved in sleep disorders and development of sleep health? Uh, thanks, uh, Bill, and great question. Um, we've uh, been interested in, in sleep uh, for quite a while, including with some of our, our colleagues, as you know, published a, a few papers along the way, not a primary focus of my lab, but always uh, so interesting and again relevant to the previous question here's a case where uh, as we well know in sleep you you need to separate the actions of one part of the brain from another this is how we have our sleep paralysis that's so important uh, in, uh, in in our, our dream states and uh, that would be very very interesting uh, to, to carry out this sort of uh, uh, recording uh, particularly in, in uh, REM states, for example, and, and look for these uh, uh, dissociative-like patterns involving the thalamus. We're not doing that right now. Happy to, to, to help or collaborate, uh, but great question. Great, thank you. Uh, 
So, and then the next question is from William Tucker, who says, if and when the network subserving PTSD symptoms, such as dissociation, are identified, can you imagine targeting the cells involved with optogenetics to turn them off and relieve such symptoms? Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is really interesting. Um, it it touches on a common theme in psychiatry, which is the the fact that symptoms in many cases are part of a spectrum uh, that appears adaptive at part of the on, on part of the spectrum and maladaptive on another part. And I think dissociation is one of those. We've, we've talked about already here the adaptive value. Many patients, uh, it's extremely maladaptive. The PTSD patients you mentioned, I've had other people write to me, um, even without PTSD, people who describe relatively normal, you know, highly functioning lives. And then after, you know, uh, you know a, a period of stress or sometimes a cannabinoid exposure, a uh, very interesting theme there, very often shows up with, with a cannabinoid um, uh, ingestion. A stable, unfortunately stable uh, dissociative pattern is, is, appears in the patient's life and it's incredibly disruptive, a great deal of suffering and, and can lose immense socio-occupational functioning. Um, so therapeutically, what, what could you do? Well, uh, the interesting thing here is that if, if the, as it does seem the case that there's a, a, not just a region, but a layer, and maybe, you know, even within that layer, there may even be a cell type that's involved in, in rhythm generation, uh, identified with optogenetics, uh, the eventual intervention in people need not even be optogenetic. It, it, it could be, but but if it's a cell that's involved and it's layer five, it's retrosplenial, and it may have some other identifiers, uh, you could design a medication based on knowledge of deep knowledge of that cell. Uh, we're hoping to get deep uh, transcriptome mining from these layer five retrosplenial cells and see what GPCRs might be selective there, what ion channels might be more expressed in these cells than other cells uh, and beyond the HCN1 channel itself. And by turning those cells up or down, you could definitely imagine even, you know, optogenetics informed, uh, but not even directly optogenetics based uh, uh, therapies. Um, so I think that's probably the most interesting therapeutic path. Great. Thanks, Carl. That, that relates to a question I was going to ask you, which is about how specific the optogenetics findings can be for certain cell types um, and how crude or blunt our current therapeutic, you know, you showed the slide about magnetic and electrical stimul brain stimulation and how blunt those approaches are, but, but that's true of our current medications as well. Um, could you say more about how you can sort of, how you envisioning getting down to that level of specificity with the therapeutic intervention, how you could stimulate, you know, selectively target specific cell types with a, a drug or other, uh, you know, interventions in humans? Yeah, I'd say like, like any uh, brain state, it would depend on the patient's severity of symptoms and what else has been tried. Of course, there's a spectrum for, you know, for Parkinson's, for spasticity, for, for depression. We go through a range of different invasiveness uh, strategies. For some of the patients who have dissociation, they absolutely would be candidates for an invasive uh, implantation of electrode. And you can imagine a, a responsive neurostimulator that picked up the uh, abnormal rhythm and stimulated to disrupt the rhythm. Um, and that would be very interesting for some patients. We'd have to show there'd be a lot of groundwork to do in mouse models uh, uh, to show that that worked. The problem is these deep posteromedial structures, although they're on the surface in the mouse brain, they're very deep in human. Uh, and so you can't access them with a, uh, a typical superficial intervention. TMS, uh, I don't think uh, would affect, would efficiently reach these deep structures. Um, and uh, you'd have to look at other, other methodologies. Um, you know, optogenetics works uh, in, in primates. It's been used in humans to, to cure blindness. Um, <coughs> but I would, I would still favor the uh, optogenetics guided medication treatment uh, strategy where uh, we build on our, you know, our causal knowledge and cell type knowledge and armed with that knowledge, we, we, are, we develop specific medicines. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Arturo Torres, who says, um, 
he asks how dissociative states and hallucinations or hallucinative states may relate with each other. Could hallucinations partially share similar mechanisms with dissociation, but lacking the consciousness of the state? In the same line, ketamine is actually reported to induce hallucination-like perceptions in mice. How would this relate to your observations? Yeah. So this is this is very interesting. Um, so ketamine and indeed dissociative drugs do cause uh, not just this self uh, alteration of the sense of self and the unity of it, but altered perceptions, uh, altered perceptions of time, altered perceptions of space. Um, uh, but as you allude to in the question, not really frank formed uh, hallucinations. And, and conversely, the, the, the true hallucinogens, uh, the, the true psychedelics uh, like LSD, uh, they don't, although they certainly do that, they, they tend not to cause these, these true dissociative experiences, the, the, the separation of the, of the self uh, from the body. Now, that said, uh, those are, you know, uh, our, our words, our terms are ultimately imprecise descriptions of these states and, and these things can blur a little bit at the boundaries, but the, these classes do seem uh, and are quite, quite different in their, the type of symptoms they elicit. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't uh, shared uh, circuit uh, mechanisms of, of some kind. And, you know, we're, we're, we didn't see, when we administered LSD, we didn't see anything like this, this rhythm. I suspect what's going on with the hallucinogens is something more uh, cellular resolution in the terms of, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, local circuitry, uh, uh, spurious patterns of activity, spurious correlations among individual cells uh, being given more significance, more ability to escape out into the broader brain than they would otherwise in the, in the healthy brain uh, or the non-drug exposed brain uh, be able to. And so I, I suspect the insights there will require uh, uh, cellular resolution, stimulation, and imaging, which optogenetics is, is as you've seen, very well suited for. Uh, but we haven't seen striking brain-wide uh, patterns or rhythmicity with the hallucinogens. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Ralph Wharton. He says, fascinating talk. Congrats. Does color sensitivity create different circuit response? So I'm not sure if it's about um, perception, color perception, or do you have thoughts about that question? Oh, okay, I, I would have, uh, I, the, the, so certainly the, uh, the options, we make these different color, uh, different responsive different colors of light. Those, uh, we can actually shift their color responsiveness, but they still operate in, in fundamentally the same ways. So uh, that's pretty useful. Uh, we sh shift the light used, but they're still the same basic kind of, of, of tool. Um, they all have other properties uh, that are relevant, different kinetics, different sensitivity, but it's amazing how we can selectively change the color and still keep it the same kind of tool, and that's really powerful. Great. Thank you. Our next question, uh, two questions from Jody Weinstein, she, uh, who says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Two questions, if I may. Uh, I understand that with RS Carmine, you've achieved uh, a red shifted carmine that isn't stimulated by blue light. How is this red shift achieved? Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll just ask them in, in series. Do you want yeah. to tackle that one first? Yep, that's great. So this was, it was absolutely critical to get the high resolution structure of carmine because only with that, first of all, it's so, it's, a, it's, it's this whole separate family, the pump-like channel reductions. We had other structures that we gotten in the past of the, of the classical cation and anion dimeric channel rhodopsins, but their sequence homology is so different from this, this weird pump-like family of which Carmine's a member that we couldn't know what the, with any certainty, what the retinal binding pocket was like. And that's this, this tight uh, little uh, slot that of formed by amino acid residues into which the all trans retinal, the chromophore fits uh, like a coin. And that, and that is a, uh, the, the pattern of that pocket uh, around the coin is uh, determines in, in, a, in a powerful way the uh, properties of the photon to which the all-trans retinal can respond and uh, achieve this isomerization and form this kink. And it's, to be more specific, it's the electrostatic gradient along the, the slot, along the, the pocket that, that, that matters. And we can tune the gradient, the steepness of the electrostatics along that gradient, along the uh, 
polyene structure of the retinal, and that uh, turns out to shift the, the spectrum. Now we had tried that, and other people had tried for 15 years or more, we tried that to reduce the blue shoulder and other opsins, and it had small effects, um, but, but not enough to be as useful as we wanted. For carmine, the effect was enormous. We don't yet know exactly why it worked so well with, with carmine, but it, it did, and it was guided by that structural knowledge. We needed to get the high resolution structure of carmine and was guided by this electrostatic uh, principle. Great, thank you. And Jody's second question is in a very different domain. Uh, she says, paraphrased from one of your patient's quotes, without any sort of emotional reaction, that was the quote of a patient, this suggests something more than or different than separation of sense of self from the body. How do you conceptualize emotional reaction in this sense? Well, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, that, that quote in isolation makes you think of other things, right? You, you look at that and you think there's, there's some kind of flattening uh, of, of affect. Uh, but, but in reality, in the fuller uh, context, these, these patients are, are not flat. Uh, they, they're able to achieve... Uh, broad ranges, they, they can laugh, they can be sad uh, on, in the dissociative state. It's just the association of affect with something happening to the body that's, that's, uh, that's separate. So um, uh, I would, yeah, I would, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not like an anesthetized uh, state. It's the, the states are present, just uh, not correlated with what's happening in the body. Got it, thank you. Uh, and then a next question from Mark Saunders, who asks this. Uh, assuming ketamine, PCP, and MK801 are presumably acting by blocking NMDA receptors to produce dissociation, do you know whether the NMDA receptor targets are localized in retrosplenial cortex or other regions projecting there? Yeah, great question. So I, I haven't talked too much about NMDA receptors, but you're right about that commonality. And we do think that reducing excitatory input to the HCN1 expressing cells in retrosplenial cortex is likely part of the mechanism by which these drugs share this dissociative effect. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's very relevant. And we've actually done, I didn't dwell on it, but we've looked at MDA receptor knockouts uh, and those did also disrupt uh, the rhythm. Um, so I do think that NMDA receptor plays a role in, um, in, in uh, facilitating the the, the excitatory drive that uh, uh, ends up funneling through the HCN1 channel uh, a rhythm to give rise to the oscillation. And uh, um, it's, but it's, it's not, it's expression is, uh, as you no doubt appreciate is, is more general. So the NMDA receptor very widely expressed. Uh, HCN1 uh, channel more, more selective in its expression. You know, it's there, it's, it shows up in patches of the brain, retrosplenial, also parts of hippocampus. Uh, and but this layer and regional specificity, I think, makes it a more uh, potentially interesting selective uh, target. And when you blocked dissociation through that HCN1 knockout, did you look to see if it had any Im impact on antidepressant-like effects of ketamine? Oh yeah, um, we did not. Um, but that's that is very interesting. Um, that's very worth uh, exploring. Um, as many of you will know, of course, ketamine is. A, Approved as an antidepressant. Uh, if you, it's funny if you read the package insert of the the nasal, uh, you know, ketamine formulation. You know that they just dissociative <laughs> side effects are noted as you know to be present in two thirds or more of, of the people who, who who take it, which raises the immediate question: um, Is dissociation in some sense part of the therapy, or is this purely an incidental uh, correspondence? Definitely, that should be studied in in animals, uh, animal subjects. I don't have a uh, any uh, knowledge on that yet, uh, but it's super interesting. You you could imagine that that being the case, that separating uh, the sense of self from negative cognitions or negative experiences could be part of a path to recovery for for uh, depression. But I don't know. I, I don't know if that's if that's the mechanism or not. Great. Well, we're incredibly grateful that it was an amazing talk and a very lively Q&A. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. I'm sorry it couldn't be in person, but it was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for all the great questions. Uh, great to, to, to speak to you all, even virtually, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.